Welcome everyone uh, to History 264. Uh, I'm Zeb Aleph, I'm Provost of Hebrew Theological College and Associate Professor at Turo College. I am so, so delighted to welcome everyone to the House of Aaron Belt, Rabbi Aaron Cutler and the formation of the Yeshiva world in America. And I can't think of two people uh, that I would rather gain from their wisdom and insight on this topic than uh, Yellow Finkelman and uh, Leslie Ginsberg Klein. Uh, their bios are way too long uh, to uh, rehearse right now, but very, very briefly, they'll forgive me. Uh, Yellow Finkelman is curator of the Chaim and Hannah Solomon Judaica Collection at the National Library of Israel. Uh, he's written extensively on the culture of contemporary orthodoxy, and I believe two incredibly seminal articles on the uh, base Medrash Gavoa of Lakewood, New Jersey, and Ravar and Cutler uh, that are uh, uh, formational, uh, certainly to my own scholarship, and I imagine to many other people, I know other people as well. Uh, Leslie Ginsberg Klein is the academic dean of Women's Institute of Torah, Semina of Torah Seminary and College, an Orthodox Jewish college for women in Baltimore. Uh, Leslie uh, wrote her dissertation on Beis Yaakov, on the formation and development of Beis Yaakov in the United States. Uh, she's published a number of uh, both scholarly and popular articles on that subject. And um, really one of the exciting things here is to talk about the yeshiva world in uh, both men and women. Uh, it's the yeshiva world's not just the yeshiva. Uh, it's something much larger and I'm so excited uh, and thrilled uh, to uh, welcome you both here. Thank you. Thanks, pleasure. So where to begin? This is a, an image, a uh, hard to find image, I must confess, uh, of the Orthodox Tribune, I'm just gonna put everybody here, uh, which uh, in its first uh, two uh, years of publication was known as Orthodox Youth. It was uh, produced by Pirche. It was, uh, it was produced by the Zire Agudas Yisrael before it was actually attached to the Agudas Yisrael of America. Uh, and you can understand from this document, uh, we could have also reproduced uh, images from Hapardes and some other rabbinic journals, but here are the many American-born Orthodox Jewish teenagers who are anticipating the arrival in 5701, so in 1941, uh, of Rav Aaron Cutler. Rabbi Aaron Cutler on way to Japan. And when he arrives finally in San Francisco, actually uh, very near to Pesach in 1941, uh, he delivers a very, very short speech, actually. Uh, from the Aguda archives, you can see on the bottom right is Ravaran Cutler's handwriting. This is the actual speech that he had prepared and he took out of his pocket when he disembarked in the San Francisco ports. Uh, and he writes the following, and I, this is, I think, really important to begin our discussion. Motelat alenu hachova laaso kekol yecholotinu almanadim toa et ohalei hatorah b'tzidiyonai. It's our obligation, he's speaking not just in the royal we, but he's looking at the Orthodox Jewish delegation, which has welcomed him with great anticipation and fervor in San Francisco. He's not gonna stay long, he's gonna travel with Rabbi Eliezer Silver through Cincinnati onward to New York in time for Pesach, in, in time for Passover. And he says, it's our, I've come here on a mission, says Rav Aaron Cutler to build, to rebuild, not just build, to rebuild Bidimyotan Ubekomotan in its exact structures, the yeshiva world that I have left behind me in Europe, Khan Ba'aretz Zu, in this land, in this, uh, he's not clear, is it a golden Medina, is it a Trevena Medina, who knows, but at any rate, uh, he anticipates rebuilding that he's taking it as his personal mission, and he's entreating other people to join him as well. Here is where, where I want to draw upon and begin our discussion. And it's well known, Yidua. He doesn't think he's introducing this legend to anyone else. It's well known in his circles. Ah, uh, Nididata Torah. 
Besar Aksaniot Ad Ba'u Shal Mashiach Tikenu, that the Torah is supposed to traverse the globe, have 10 different stops, Vachayena uh, Achrona, and its final encampment, Tia America, will be the United States of America. This, I have an article coming out on this legend, so I was so thrilled that Yoel wanted to also discuss this as well. And uh, Leslie, uh, I've also in uh, previous conversations mentioned this legend to you. Legend, not that it's not true, uh, but it's part of the folk culture. I have no way of verifying if it's true or not. If Rabbi Chaim of Volazhin, who dies in uh, the early uh, 19th century, so America was still in the early Republic, what, what he knew about it, but it is supposedly the case that Rabbi Chaim of Volazhin had anticipated uh, at a Shalashudis Drusha in the Yeshiva of Volazhin uh, that. Torah would travel in 10 different places until uh, in fin the final stop he wrote, he, he indicated, he had write on Shabbos, uh, he indicated would be the United States. Uh, and then at some point he began to cry. And Rabbi David Tavala, uh, most versions of the story goes, uh, he had the audacity to ask his master uh, a little bit afterward, why did you cry? And he said, I cry because I can't possibly fathom how difficult it will be to settle Torah in America. And the original incarnations of the story have it that he's crying over assimilation, that he understands some way, somehow, that there will be many Jewish souls lost to the Trefin and Medina, to the fact that many people will be lost because just to establish Torah centers, to uh, be pioneers in the American Torah experiment, we're going to lose a lot of people to uh, those who will assimilate. Ravon Cutler, in this version, uh, doesn't indicate exactly so many of the details, but he tells it in other cases. And one person who, we're not sure if he learned the story from Ravon Cutler, but the yeshiva world has adopted a particular valence in understanding this story, um, and I've provided some audio from Rabbi Mordechai Gifter in the late 1980s. And uh, after this, I'll open it up uh, to learn, uh, you'll hear less from me and more from our panelists. There we go. And I keep telling the story that the Chaim Valozhanov, the first and great yeshiva of Lithuanian Polish Jewry, once burst out crying, the last station for Torah before the coming of Mashiach will be the United States of America. And one of his great disciples asked him, so why does the Rebbe cry? What's there to cry about? His answer was, I see how bitter it will be to create this last station. No one understood what he's talking about, what he was talking about. When Hitler came along, we began to understand what Reb Chaim Valozhenor had in mind. So the story is changed. One from a focus on tears for assimilation to, and Rav Gifter did not change. We don't know exactly how stories are transformed, although it's quite interesting. But the Tells of Rosh Hashiva in the late 1980s, um, along with so many, I can, Rav Ruderman from Baltimore, uh, Rav David Lifshitz uh, at, at a Hespit, at a eulogy for Rav Schneider Cutler, and Rav Aaron Cutler himself have transformed the mission of the yeshiva world to resurrect what was lost in the Holocaust. How much of that undergirds the larger ethos of the yeshiva world in America when Byron Cutler arrives in the early 1940s? Uh, maybe until this time, we'll keep it in the immediate post-war period, the 50s and then maybe the 60s as well. Um, I'd like to say something about the moment at which Ravarin is speaking here, because um, from what we know about Ravarin in Europe, he was like most of the Russian yeshiva in 
Jewish Lithuania um, opposed, absolutely opposed in principle to, uh, to any kind of immigration to the new world. And there was certainly a sense, uh, there are, are recollections we have from a number of students uh, who, who really, when they talked about immigration, really got a, a very hard time from Ravaran uh, in the old country in, in Slutsk and in Kletsk. Um, and uh, Ravaran must have gone through two dramatic shifts in the years between the 1930s and when he arrived in 1941. Um, the first shift is that he, as comes loud and clear through this text, is that he went from being somebody who um, could not imagine uh, any kind of Torah life in, or what he would define as Torah life in, in North America, to somebody who felt that there was absolutely no choice but to replant um, to replant what he considered the yeshiva in the new world. And, and what comes across here, and, and it's hard to know how much of this is, is said with what kind of confidence, but I certainly get the impression that Rav Aron had a, uh, a really deep-seated sense that whatever the catastrophe that, had go that was going on in Europe, it was literally unthinkable that yeshivas could not be transplanted um, somewhere else. Because he, he uses language here when he talks about and, and he repeats this throughout his, his drashot in all kinds of, uh, um, uh, in all kinds of contexts. The method of Talmud Torah um, has absolutely not changed at all over the course of history. And the uh, institutions, the, the, the methodology um, have not, has not changed. So, uh, and, and since Rav Aaron shared certainly with Rav Chaim um, uh, and the entire Lithuanian yeshiva world, a sense that, that Talmud Torah is the, is, is the stuff of existence. It's the thing that makes the world go around. It's the single most important thing that anybody could ever do. So if you put those two together, um, it's it's literally theologically unthinkable to imagine uh, Torah not being transplanted um, in 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 the New World, and um, and people thought he was off his his rocker. People thought he was he was crazy. That he was even even the kind of first flowerings of 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 the yeshiva environment from the late 19th into the first half of the 20th century um, was not what Rivarin describes here as, as the character form size, uh, you know, fully and authentically, uh, um, this unchanging institution and method of Torah study. He certainly had no truck with compromise with college education. Um, he didn't think that, uh, that doing anything other than learning was, was what was valuable. So, so he has to kind of come to this realization that what he thought was impossible a couple of years earlier has to almost by definition be impossible. And the second transformation he had to do was to become the mouthpiece for what he thought um, at some kind of deep theological level how to be in inevitable. And again, this required the kind of integrity and backbone um, and uncompromising vision that he had um, to be able to say, okay, it has to happen and I can make it happen. I can make it happen by an act of, of pure will, um, simply because it must, simply because this is the core and the, and the center of Judaism. This is the core and center of Torah. So, so I'm just going to get up and make it happen. I mean, he's speaking with an enormous amount of confidence. And if there are a lot of stories about Hasidic uh, uh, Rabbeim who arrive in America and they go through a difficult transition um, to try to figure out what what kind of a role they might play in this new world and and hesitating and, and baby steps and trying to rebuild communities and bring in outsiders uh, in tiny institutions, Ravarin hit the ground running. Um, and the kind of confidence that comes through in this in this short text, I think, is is part of that. Right. And while certainly a uh, method of analysis in the Shiva had been changing 
uh, particularly with the advent of the Brisker method in the early 20th century, one area of Jewish education which was transformed was, of course, in uh, girls' education in Beis Yaakov. And Leslie, what, what you've done in a lot of your scholarship is showing how uh, the Holocaust and the post-war period actually transformed Beis Yaakov yet again. Yeah, I, I would say globally in, for the day school movement, the Holocaust was very significant. I was just pulling up while you were talking an article from the Orthodox Tribune, which you um, showed an image of earlier. This is from 1945. There was a campaign for, for um, Jewish school registration. And they write explicitly, this extraordinary measure has been taken because of the news from Europe that few Jewish children have survived, thus feeling, um, sealing the fate of the future of European Jewry, the former reservoir of Jewish spiritual and religious life in the world. Skipping down, um, rabbis and congreg congregational leaders will appeal from the pulpits for the replanting of Jewish learning in this country basing their pleas on the fact that the yeshiva educational system has made great progress in American secular education and in Jewish traditional learning. It goes on to say that only the day school system can combine the harmonious teachings of all that is good in America and in Judaism. And I think that's very emblematic of what was happening in the 40s. It's this two-prong campaign um, on the one hand, you know, it's this idea that, well, before we could have relied on Europe and if somebody wanted to go learn in yeshiva, so they get on a boat and they, they go to Europe. But now those institutions don't exist anymore. And therefore, because of the Holocaust, we have to plant them on American soil. Now, helping that, of course, was the fact that people had come over um, from Europe who were more steeped in the ideology. So for Beis Yaakov, that was really significant. Um, there were attempts to start Beis Yaakov style schools in the late 30s and they failed. And the, the people who successfully started Beis Yaakov schools um, were Rav Aram Newhouse, who was familiar with the system. He had come over recently from Europe. Who, he started the first Beis Yaakov elementary school that survived. Uh, initially in Williamsburg and now in Borough Park, and most famously, Rautin Vichna Kaplan, who started the first seminary and high school, and she herself being a graduate of the seminary in, um, in, in, um, in Krakow. And what is also significant is that second part is that there was very much a need to present day school as American, because there was this idea that day school was un-American, public school's great. Why do we wanna create separation, create this ghetto mentality? So the people who, who are coming from Europe and were already familiar with Beis Yaakov, with similar Aguda schools in Europe were much more amenable, but to sell it to the, the um, American population, American Orthodox, and in some of the immigrants as well, there was a need to present day school education as, American as something that's American. And there was, if I can pull up a source, um, in 1947, there was a pamphlet advertising Beis Yaakov Elementary Schools, and it presented the aim of Beis Yaakov as to educate the girlhood of Israel in the spirit of uncompromising Judaism, to teach those subjects most conducive to molding the developing mind on the basis of the Torah and on the high principles of American democracy, to produce a mature Jewish daughter, steadfast in her religion, proud of her full Jewish life, loyal to American ideals, and trustful of a final redemption of the Jewish people. So there's this element of, of the loyal to American ideals, which you see very much in the 40s, going into the 50s, by, by the 60s when, when day school is already for this community of Feta Kampli, you don't see that anymore. There isn't the need to sell it in the same way there was in the 40s. And uh, y'all, you, you recommended that we review one of uh, Ravon Cutler's uh, sermons, and here I've given an excerpt from it. Uh, what are we looking at here? 
Ah, they were, uh, we're looking at uh, his macha on behalf of the brisker rav. Yeah, if I if I recall correctly, this is actually part of a of a of a eulogy um, for the brisker rav. Um, I'm taking out the the volume. Um, the this volume is a Dalid, uh, page two hundred and twelve. Um, it could be that it's conflated. It's both the eulogy, but it's also the Briskarov was under siege in Israel, and there was a conference uh, held uh, in America. Everyone. Oh, from, no, 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 you're correct. Yeah, yeah, I'm confused. Rabbi Salavay, Victor uh, yeah. were, uh were in attendance. And Ravon Cutler, in defending the, the legacy, and he's still alive, is the Briskarov. Just what, what he represents, um, towards the end, really part of the conclusion, uh, he offers a comment or two about college. What, and those people who are dividing time, and I should say is that it makes sense to do so, is that William Helmreich, who just passed away, uh, wrote a really wonderful book about the yeshiva world that we're all indebted, we've all, all three of us have used. Uh, and uh, there, uh, he shows that in the 50s and 60s, uh, most uh, of the students of the of the men and Leslie, you can say much more, and you've written about the women um, at Chaim Berlin and Torah Das uh, are attending college concurrent to their yeshiva studies. And uh, Helmreich uh, he suggests that even in places like Tells and Lakewood, where they had absolutely no truck for concurrent college education, after when they were alumni, when they departed from Lakewood and from Cleveland. Uh, many of their young men uh, would attend college after that. What do we make of this source? Maybe you know, if you want to read some of it. Um, um, yeah, so I actually right. have, I was conflating the, the Hespade for his, uh, for, this, um, for this public meeting because they touch on, on, on related themes. Um, uh, the Brisker Rub was kind of the, the right wing uh, extreme among Israeli misnagdim among Israeli Lithuanians, um, and he, un, he was very, very ambivalent about Aguda. He was very ambivalent about um, um, about the the section of the yeshiva world that had been integrating into Israeli life and into the the developing Israeli political system or the the transition from the Zionist movement um, to the state of Israel. And uh, and and Ravaron, who who shared some of that ambivalence, but was was more of a dyed in the wool Agudist. He really was um, solidly in the Aguda camp. Spoke publicly quite often uh, about the need to see the Brisker Rav as the embodiment of of Das Torah and as the embodiment of of the of the Gadolim or the Gadol right. of well, the with, time. With, even though there were parenthetically when. Uh... This is in between the deaths of, this is, this is delivered between 53 and 59. So Chazanish has passed away. And really, as you point out, uh, for many, many, many people, uh, the Briskarov is the uncontested Gadol Hador. Yeah. Um, and so this was less of an issue. This, this public uh, lecture, which was primarily an attack uh, against the attempt to create uh, Eichel Shlomo and, and some kind of a centralized Zionist rabbinate uh, in, in Israel, um, it has this American twist because the question of college education was not quite the key question uh, in Israel, but it was a very, very central question for the yeshiva world in the United States. And Ravaran's position, again, this is part of his, of his backbone and his, part of his willingness to kind of expand the, the, what, what was even imaginable among, among yeshiva oriented Jews in the United States. His answer, his stated answer to college was, was loimit than aleph, absolutely not. Um, you know, not happening, certainly not when you are in, when you're studying um, Talmud Torah because of this timeless method that, that, he, that he saw having been passed down through the generations. It's only, it's only among those who are fully dedicated to it. Um, there's, of course, ironies here because Rav Chaim of Alashin and some of, of the Misnagri predecessors from Europe actually had much kinder things to say about Balabatim and about, and about 
the interplay between working for a living and, and Talmud Torah. But, but for the American environment, Rav Aaron's position was, was absolutely no college. I spoke to some of his students who said that quietly, uh, when they left the yeshiva in Lakewood, um, he, with some measure of reluctance, um, was willing to see them go into white collar professions and get um, and get some kind of an education, uh, but he 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 never said anything like that, as far as I know, uh, in public. Um, and I I you know here the text that you've brought from here makes it very very clear that he's he does not tolerate um, any kind of um, um, any kind of uh, what why you would would come to call Torah Umada or, or emerging or institution like Yeshiva University. But he's also, he had been uh, really quite harsh in his treatment of some of the American yeshivas as well. And, and here maybe I'll actually, from a very, very similar context, um, I was thinking of the Hesped that he gave. Um, but after attacking uh, uh, Yeshiva University, um, in no uncertain terms, he says, and here I'm in the third volume of Mishnah's Rabbi Aaron on page Reish uh, Ted Zion. He says, Yesh gam ka'eva ha-tovim mehem. There's better than these, than the Yeshiva University types, which he's already called kofrim and reformim and heretics and, and, and the like. Um, אבל בכל זאת הולכים בדרך של פשרות מסוימות מתוך הנחה כי בכך הם בוחרים את הרב המיעוטו. There are people who are better than the YU types and the Yeshiva University types than the integrationists, but, um, but still they go follow a path of, of certain kinds of compromises based on the assumption that, um, that they're choosing the least of two evils um hema ta'ut chamura umara they're making a a very very um dramatic mistake um ki besofo shel davar yedei darchehem u pishrohem hem agim le rabru bo u beru u beru bo mamash it's a short step from there uh from the the worst the the least of two evils to to the complete to the complete evil and and again, the reality I think was somewhat more complicated, and he was aware of the fact that the reality was more complicated. Um, but the rhetoric is is absolutely uncompromising. It's not as if Ravaran went then on a crusade against Torah Hadas or against uh, or against uh, the yeshivas um, uh, that were kind of more in his orbit. Um, that he went on a crusade against them, uh, but he had harsh things to say. And that's also part of his, his personality. I don't think it's the only example where his rhetoric was harsher than what he uh, saw on the ground and what he was willing to put up with, but, but certainly the rhetoric here is, 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 is uncompromising um, about college. And to this day, it's, it's certainly not by accident that, that even though Lakewood has become a much more complicated and diverse place, well, diverse may not be the right term, but, but the Lakewood yeshivish community um, has become has become exponentially larger than anything Ravarin could have imagined, and therefore, in that sense, more diverse and complicated. Um, but what he envisioned uh, for Lakewood was just this, this sea, this uh, this oasis of Torah, and he uses this metaphor in in the waste de wasteful desert of America. Um, and and it's unlike, not just like right, the influence. The point is that that certainly for Lakewood, but the ripple effects are tremendous. Yeah. Right, I mean, especially under Rav Schneer, Rav Schneer Cutler and, and the movement to create satellite kolels. But I actually want to connect this to what, what Leslie had said earlier, that if the rhetoric of Beis Yaakov um, in an attempt to attract elementary and high school students was in the 40s, in the, in, in the, in the, in the mid-century, was a rhetoric of Americanization and it's possible to live comfortably in both worlds, that was not Rav Aaron's rhetoric even though he was a fan of what was going on in Beis Yaakov, even though he was supportive of Torah and Masora, even though he was supportive of what was happening um, uh, in some of the yeshivas that did allow college, um, that's not, that's not Ravarin's rhetoric. Uh, he, he realized maybe when he wasn't upset about the death of, of the Grizz that, um, that uh, he realized that some of this compromise might be the only way to go forward, but he was not prepared to use any of that language that was necessary to bring in elementary and high school students and their middle-class parents. 
And, and uh, Leslie, if I'll uh, have you come in. One, I think you had mentioned also, I was seized by, was how the day school was that agent of Americanization, that public schools were these golden citadels. Well, for day schools, um, a transition to college was expected. Yeah, and so even, yeah, go ahead. So it's interesting that even though, say, talking about Revison Kaplan's high school, that um, she was not positive towards college, they still sought accreditation. They, you know, to be able to offer a Regents diploma because they were aware that if students couldn't graduate and go on to City College, the city, you know, the CUNY system, they parents wouldn't send. So whether or not, whether you know, I, I can't say if that was a Bidyevit or a Lichat Fila or somewhere in the middle, but they did go after accreditation. It doesn't seem like they did it really enthusiastically because took them something like 30 years to, to um, meet all the requirements. But once they had pending status, they could give a Regents diploma, that was good enough for them. Um, you know, if you compare, um, and, and I have compared, let's say Central Yeshiva University's high school and um, Esther Schoenfeld's, which was a more moderate base Yaakov high school, so to speak, their, their attitude towards the accreditation process was much more aggressive than say Robinson Kaplan's base Yaakov. So I think it is clear there was some ambivalence from the start about getting this accreditation that would allow students to go to college, but, but they did. Um, certainly by the 60s, they're already speaking against going to college, even though many of their students are going to college. I remember speaking to, oh, especially students who are coming from out of town, because let's say for example, in Baltimore, going to, um, the Base Yaakov Seminary and to a CUNY college was a very popular choice when for students graduating in the 60s uh, until Israel becomes the default option. Um, New York, you kind of see, you know, Israel become more and more popular until the point they stop asking what students are doing when they graduate because the assumption is everyone's going to seminary in Israel. But in, in the earlier years, in, in the 60s, um, that was a very popular option. I have, I interviewed a student who said that she secretly went to college after graduating. She was really conflicted about it, but she really wanted to do it. And so she enrolled in college, um, keeping it a secret. And she was also at the time teaching math at the Base Yaakov High School. And she, she said to me, I took one semester because I really wanted to, but I felt like all hell was opening up because I was doing a really bad thing and I stopped. I felt like I was leading a dual secret horrible life because a real base Yaakov girl didn't go to college. So it was kind of an interesting, you know, she went for a little bit and then she stopped. And I believe if I'm thinking of the right student, she ended up getting a job teaching Jewish studies at the high school and knew once she was teaching Jewish studies, then it wasn't even a question. She couldn't. She couldn't teach there anymore. I mean, she couldn't go to college anymore, and you couldn't be a Jewish studies teacher and go to college. So that that solidified the the decision for her. So that that's and to this day, Base Yaakov High School does not encourage college. What's interesting though is I think that there's a little bit of a different reasoning. I, I think a, for the men's yeshivos, there's very much in in a bitzelzman factor and a wasting time that could be spent in Torah study, which doesn't exist for women. So it wasn't that like they shouldn't go to college because they're supposed to be learning full time. It's that the ideal thing to do is to become a teacher. And if you're going to become a teacher, you should be going to the Beis Yaakov Seminary, doing their seminary program, graduating and becoming a teacher. So you don't need to go to college for that. Alternatively, you know, there was like business, you could take business classes, but it wasn't like a learn it wasn't a don't go to college and learn, it was don't go to college because you can get the vocational training you need and you don't need to go to college because the college environment, you know, that, that's not a safe place. Um, initially intellectually unsafe, as time goes on, it becomes more of a social thing, socially unsafe as, you know, the college campus becomes Thanks. synonymous with protests, with sexual promiscuity, with liberalism, that college becomes like, not a positive place. But even to this day, they wouldn't encourage, Tur you know, going to Turo, for example. Um, but other Beis Yaakov schools, like if you want to take um, Esther Schoenfeld, 
So Esther Schoenfeld, students went to college. Um, Esther Schoenfeld subsequently branched out into Brooklyn, closed the, the um, Lower East Side branch, and that branch is BYA, which exists until this day. So they, when, when the yeshiva world turned against college, so then they also stopped recommending college, even though many students went. Um, but once, once Turo came about and that became acceptable, so then that is a totally acceptable option in, in more moderate base Yaakov schools. And then today you have the schools like Manhattan High School that have students going, which is a base Yaakov school, and have students going Ivy League. Um, so there are a lot of shifts through you know, the past 50 years on the relationship of base Yaakov College, and it varies wildly based on the individual school. You know, the same way that, that um, you know, Orthodoxy is not heterogeneous, not homogenous. Yeah, yeah. The same is true of, of Beis Yaakov, which is a bi big difference from, you know, when people try to compare Beis Yaakov in Europe and Beis Yaakov in America, the most fundamental difference is that Beis Yaakov in Europe was a school system that had an umbrella organization that was dictating policy for all schools. That gets destroyed by the Holocaust. And even though you know, Robinson Kaplan was the only person to ever get official permission to start a Beis Yaakov in America, and because of that, that's why her school, one of the reasons her school has a legitimacy that other schools didn't have. Um, but in America, Beis Yaakov, like everything else in America, is kind of a voluntary thing. You want to start a Beis Yaakov? Start a Beis Yaakov. No, there's no trademark. Anyone who wants to start a Beis Yaakov school and call it Beis Yaakov can. And while, you know, there are certain similarities, there, there are so many differences between different Beis Yaakov schools and the way you know, today schools trying to um, position themselves. I mean, there are competing base Yaakov schools. That's something you never would have had in Europe. So today, you know, you want a school that's more college prep, you can choose a school that's more college prep. And that also allows schools like um, base Yaakov, base Yaakov Borough Park High School, that allows them to be a lot more um, ideologically entrenched, so to speak, because they don't, at a certain point in the late 70s, you see a, a massive shift in Beis Yaakov schools as there gets to be more of them between feeling like a responsibility, we have to accept every student because if a student doesn't come here, she will go to public school. So there's this responsibility to want me worry. She doesn't go to our school, so go to one of the other myriad Beis Yaakov options. And, and because of that, the schools become more ideologically entrenched and can be much um, stronger on policy and rules. Even though when I was teaching in Toro, I had a student who went to, to Bay of High School. And you know, the first day I icebreakered where y'all come from, she mentioned she went to school that where she was last year was, was that high school. And I immediately stopped and I was like, do they know you're here? And she's like, no, and please don't tell them. <laughs> So I, I think you're you're picking up on the market forces and the idea of yeah. of the way in which in which the kind of free market religion of the United States creates this diversity and I think that that's one of the things that that Rivaron picked up on um, I don't know with what with what level of of self consciousness but um, but in addition to the fact that I, he he does not in the published writings that I've seen he doesn't have a lot to say about women and girls' education. And I don't think it was really all that much of a concern to him, except to the extent that it played into the lives of his, of his, of his male students and, and their, you know, their need for shiduchim. But, um, but I think this idea that he could do something so radically out of the box, and as long as he could convince enough funders and a handful of students to do it, then, then the free market let him get away with something that nobody else had really conceived of in founding, in founding the yeshiva in Lakewood. Um, and, and this gets into stuff that Zev has written quite a bit about, but, but he's able to play, um, to play this authenticity card. He's able to play this, this I'm, the, I'm the genuine uh, tradition of Eastern Europe. And there's this post-war nostalgia and guilt and horror and trying to work through the implications of the Holocaust. You know, he arrives in 41 before people really understand what's going on. I assume even he doesn't fully understand what's going on. Um, and he's able to present this image of, of transforming that we saw in the first slide 
And that really plays as a kind of marketing tool. And I don't mean that to, um, to be disparaging at all. Uh, marketing is critical in, in, in the free environment. You have to be able to sell this, this product. You have to make people want it. And he's able to sell that because America basically just says, uh, anybody can do whatever they want. And, and if they get a mark, you know, if the funders and the students are, if you build it and the funders and students come, then, then there you are. So I want to comment a few things on that. So first of all, he is quoted, and I, I gave you, I gave we'll you that. There. We'll get there, yeah. An image of that. He, Ravon Cutler is, is quoted as saying that if not for Base Yaakov, we never could have had Lakewood, which is, by the way, a statement of like, if nobody was willing to marry the graduates of Lakewood, then, oh, here, if not for Base Yaakov, Lakewood, Yeshiva could never have succeeded. So uh, yeah, yeah, that is an element of, Thank you, Basiako, for providing wives who were willing to marry men learning in Kolel, because that, that was a push of some, some Basiako schools, certainly of Rabbits and Kaplan's Basiako school. Um, maybe, he, Leslie, maybe, maybe just if you would read, um, you provided this, this excerpt from a yearbook in which Vishnu Kaplan actually says as much. Right. Um, okay, so what is, what's the maximum program for a girl educated in Basiako, you know, what, what's our ideal for the graduates? Um, let's skip, we'll skip to the next, the Dear Children paragraph, the third yes. paragraph. I hope that in the years that you spent in Basiako, you learned the Hashkafa that a woman can receive her Torah only through encouraging and strengthening her husband towards learning and by guiding her children in the ways of Torah. I am sure that your highest ideal is to marry a man whose umanut will be Torah. To, uh, what does that say? Torah, Torah. Torah. One who will dedicate his life to our Batsasa Torah. Those of you who cannot reach this high ideal should at least see to it that your husbands will have regular time set aside for learning Torah, even when it entails certain sacrifices on your part. Um, so she definitely, there was a push towards Kolel, towards marrying men living in Kolel, uh, learn, sorry, learning in Kolel, and um, and that was something that was that she's quoted Bethany Kaplan as being so proud when people married people learning in Torah it was definitely an ideal that was pushed. You can see though from writing there is that she knew it wasn't a reality for a lot of her students. I don't think that language would appear today. The like, and if you can't, then right. because there is no if you can't anymore. You know, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put up um, just so that we can have it almost side by side. Um, this is a source uh, Yola you had recommended that we look at it. Um, but I want to put in tandem this uh, Vishnik Rebison Kaplan's uh, charge to, for her graduates to support Talmud Torah with uh, what Leslie, you've written, Yola, you've written, which is so lovely, um, to put you into conversation with one another, um, is how Ravaron Cutler changes the spirit and the ideology of Talmud Torah, not just in terms of the, the, how intensive, the, uh, the intensity of Talmud Torah that there's no time for college, but also what is the purpose? The purpose is to build Gedolei Torah. The purpose, uh, Rav Aaron Cutler wouldn't live long enough to see it, but the, Lake, the, the Lakewood Kolel movement in Detroit, in Los Angeles, uh, in, uh, in Boston, in Toronto was one of the first, um, where it's about creating this ideal person that there will be sacrifices along the way. Just like Rebbitz and Kaplan, who would credit Revaron Cutler time and again with being this unofficial postsake, and her husband, Baruch, was a Talmud of Revaron Cutler, and according to the Feldheim biography, he was asked by Revaron Cutler, gave Vishnu Kaplan's uh, husband a directive, leave your teaching position so you could help your wife spearhead Beis Yaakov in America. Uh, all that was wrapped around this idea that there has to be gedolim, that there has to be leading Talmud Chachamim, and there are several accounts of, of parents asking Aaron Cutler to relent, saying that my son is not cut out for your curriculum. And uh, he wasn't as drastic as this, but he said there were people that need to be sacrificed for the greater good. There are people that, I think um, I learned that from y'all from your work, which is that we're going to talk about the elite. It's not in this democratization, although the, what's the, the ironic output is this democratization of Talmud Torah, and we'll see some liquid figures in a moment. But for Reviron Cutler, 
and for Revitz and Kaplan, it was about supporting and elevating the elite. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the text that's up here on this, on this slide, um, here the metaphor that he uses, to establish a fortress for Torah and for the fear of God. Um, so one of the metaphors that he uses is this idea of a fortress, a military metaphor, which, which, um, which the late Menachem Friedman um, made much of, of thinking about yeshivas in terms of military terminology. But he also used constantly the, um, the metaphor of, of oasis in a desert. Um, and, and this gets to the ways in which Rav Aaron was both before his time, he was a visionary, uh, and also the ways in which things shifted after his death in ways that I don't know if he could have imagined. Meaning, he's putting across this uncompromising vision of Torah. And his, his image here is, we're going to create this tiny oasis. Even New York, which has a relatively high percentage of observant Jews, that's not good enough because there's too many distractions there. There's too, too, much, too much religious diversity. It's hard to really create this fortress that's surrounded by solid walls uh, or, or an oasis in a vast desert. And what his students and what his son, Rav Schneerkutler, do after his death is to take this model and start spreading it out. And th so then, um, and, and then you get this kind of paradox in which the ideal um, of, of Gedolim, of people who are fully dedicated only, uh, only to Talmud Torah, uh, and for that, well, it's got to be transplanted to America, but let's get as far away from from things that are going on as we can, um, all of a sudden uh, these Lakewood Kolos are going out into the community and are bringing both the message of full-time Torah study in Kolel to, uh, to communities throughout North America and simultaneously becoming engaged with those communities uh, kind of as a catalyst for change. And, and what worked from being this tiny oasis or this, or this fortress became this, in, this web of institutions that, uh, that transformed all kinds of cities, that had a huge influence on all kinds of cities uh, throughout, throughout North America. And this idea of a yeshiva world that spread from Los Angeles to uh, you know to New York and Toronto and and Florida and, and Atlanta and Texas and everything in between um, is is exactly that transformation that the story um, again which I assume you know to be anachronistic or at the very least being trend you know being um, whatever Chaim did or didn't say about America it takes on a valence um, retroactively about the ways in which. Uh, in which the American yeshiva world with its unique American elements um, really happens after of Aaron's death, in part because of his, the vision that he put forward that nobody else had the guts, had the guts or the, or the vision to put forward. And so just so that uh, we can put this into perspective, uh, some, some figures, let's, uh, maybe move us all, our images out of the way. I have given you uh, Torah Masara's historian, uh, Rabbi Daniel Kramer, but more importantly, is this uh, in Rome? Unfortunately, we can't isolate uh, the Beis Yaakov trends, but they're moving in the same directions as well from the 40s until the 60s. But just to give you an understanding about how the day school movement has blossomed, uh, then again, uh, Yola had mentioned that uh, Rav Aaron Cutler could never have anticipated what would happen. Uh, so Rav Aaron Cutler dies in uh, 1962. Uh, this, this is from data from 1965. Uh, Yeshiva University, although it has a college and a rabbinical program, so its numbers are a little misleading. Um, but the next largest yeshiva is Satmar, Torah Vira. Torah Vidas has just a shade under 250. Uh, Rav Aaron Cutler dies. He passes away being the one, two, three, four, fifth largest yeshiva in the United States. And then, and these are really startling numbers. This comes, these are the official, this is the official data out of uh, 
uh, BMG out of Bismedrskovoa. Uh, fascinating, I'll point out that their data begins in Kletsk. Ravon Tutler is the Rosh Shiva. He moves it from Slutsk, where his father-in-law, Mr. Zama Meltzer, is the Rosh Shiva. He moves it because of uh, fear of pogrom uh, to Kletsk. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't... Um... Yes, there are other reasons. Some complications yes. in how and why they left. And, yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let, let's just say that there was some tension between Ravisar Zalman and his son-in-law um, about how to run the yeshiva. And yes. uh, part of the reason why he went to Kletsk was because they did not see eye to eye. So, but be that as, which is very, very important, the official data begins in Kletsk. It begins in 1923 when migrates to Kletsk. And then from 39 to 43, when Mervaron Cutler comes in 1941, he, he founds the yeshiva in Lakewood, in 19, which you all pointed out, away from the New York Orthodox hub uh, in Lakewood, New in central New Jersey. There, so there's that break in the middle where there was no yeshiva. And the yeshiva doesn't really spike until Rav Schneer's time. And if we could, and, and uh, the statisticians will, will eventually one day, and sociologists will one day allow us to do a similar trajectory for uh, Beis Yaakov schools in the United States, it'll probably look, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, quite similar to this data, right? There's nothing more profitable than opening up a Beis Yaakov school in your local community these days, uh, maybe a seminary. Uh, the, um, but you see that this, uh, this trajectory and how it catapults in the time of Rav Schneer and then finally with Rav Malkiel Cutler today uh, for BMG, uh, and data that I have available concludes in 2006. What accounts for the startling growth? <laughs> it's a loaded question. Yeah, it's a loaded question, and, and I'm not sure I know the answer, or I'm, I'm sure that I don't know the answer. Um, but, um, um, and it, it gets to the whole ongoing debate about, about the shift to the right in American orthodoxy and, 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 and things of that nature. But um, certainly some of it is, is a backlash to the counterculture of the 1960s. Um, some of it is the Vietnam War and the, the advantages of, of yeshivas and rabbinical school to keep people out of the Vietnam War. Some of it is, uh, is paralleling uh, the rise of, the, of, of strong religion uh, throughout the United States, um, a kind of religious revival uh, um, of parents of baby boomers um, that, that's also both a part of the counterculture and, and a response to the counterculture. Um, and some of it is just this ability of the American yeshiva world to offer something that is, is just compatible with what a lot of people a lot of people want. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know, um, you know, what, what, what raises that, that level, but I think that there is something particularly in Lakewood um, uh, after Ravarin's death and, and in the period of, of Rav Schneer Cutler and, and onward where the model of I don't like the word extremism here, but the, the model of something that's really uncompromising, um, the self image of something that's uncompromising is, is important. And it's something that people want out of, out of religion. It's something that, that at least some members of the community want. Remember that these are years when, when the conservative movement is also thriving. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and, and that's another piece, of course, is, is that American, you know, America becomes more pluralistic and accepting of diversity during these years. Um, but I, I think there's something to this, to this feeling of, of, of demand that, that the, that Lakewood is asking of people that the, that the yeshivas, like Ravaran says, they're making compromises. They're making compromises with college. They're making compromises with, with how long you're going to stay in the yeshiva. Um, they're making compromises with, with middle class uh, ideology. And in the yeshiva, in these years, let's say in the 60s, when there really is this super strong yeshiva, and, but not yet the total Lakewood community with all of its middle class 
um, there really is this sense of, of, again, this is something you've, you've written about, this sense of authenticity um, in the demanding, in, in what Lakewood is demanding that some of the other yeshivas are not. It's also not by accident that these are, that these are the years in which the Hasidic communities in, in, mm -hmm. in Brooklyn are, are also growing. Right. are also growing dynamically. And, and maybe I, I'm, I want to agree with everything that, that you said, Yoel. I want to add a few other things that might have led to the, the growth. Um, one is that we, you have now a second generation where, where by, the, by the 60s, 70s, you have the children of people who went to Lakewood, you have children of, of women who went to Basiaco, and that, that naturally is going to grow something. So, you know, the, the growth of the community, the fact that they're not first generation anymore, you're second generation, is an element. Also, why do people need to go to college? They need to go to college because they have to get a job. They have to make money. If you have enough of a growth of an Orthodox community that's wealthy enough in and of itself and is willing to hire graduates of these institutions without the college degree, you know, you don't have to go out of the Orthodox world to be employed, but you can get a job within the Orthodox world. You can just you know, go into business and get a job in some business and make a living, then there's no reason to go to college. Especially since college always had a utilitarian, and still does, have, it has a utilitarian um, purpose. It's not about, you know, the broad liberal arts education. It's about learning what you need to do to then make a Parnassa. Um, Which, by the way, is not that different moving in the late 1980s in America writ large. True, right, right. Um, I think that there's also a growing confidence in the Orthodox community. There's a feeling of like, we can be who we want to be. We don't have to pander. We don't have to try to like, to conform. But yes, because of the growth of pluralism and it's just, there's this growing confidence. I mean, you see that with the CM Hashas, like that is the most, you know, so explicit. Um, I think it also became easier to be on what you're calling uncompromising or to be strong in ideology becomes easier. In the 40s, I think it was harder to say that there's something in America we need to separate ourselves from. But from the 60s moving onward, it becomes a lot easier just to say, wow, we don't want any part of this. You know, especially, you know, like look at the headlines, you know, the way the, way the media played on the 60s and was was um, advertising the most outrageous things that were happening in in counterculture movements, student movements. So that becomes a lot easier for for yeshivos for Beis Yaakov schools to say, we don't want any part of this world. And that's something they couldn't do, have done as easily. Um, even with dress, it becomes. I, I remember um, interviewing a teacher in Beis Yaakov who said, you know, it was hard. Girls like fashion. It was sometimes hard to explain to them why something they were wearing was wrong but you know with the mini skirts look they're straight up us or that's that was easy you know the more extreme the more like quote unquote unsneeze fashion got the easier it is to market sneeze and it's and i think that's the same across the board and one of the i think the i the great ironies is that we take a yeshiva which in the 18th, 19th centuries, certainly in the 19th century, was for the elite. It was only, uh, by most accounts, uh, the Shivan Velazhin only had about 200 uh, young men, and those men were those who passed through, as Charles Stamper has taught us, passed through every single stage of the Cheder system. They have passed through the regional base medrash, the cloys, and now they are, uh, they've made it so-called to the major leagues. And now with the democratization of the yeshiva world, there's this great expansion on the very word yeshiva. Now a woman with a very circumscribed role perhaps is a member of the yeshiva world. She can claim, talk about pluralism, she can claim entry into a, uh, into a club, into a, not just a community. And, and Beis Yaakov very much paralleled the developments in the male world around them. In, um, in Europe, where Beis Yaakov was very highly Hasidish, you see that the structure of Beis Yaakov replicates Hasidism. And uh, Sarah Schneer starts to inhabit in her student's mind this role of Rebbe. And, and um, similarly in America, where Beis Yaakov really wasn't Hasidish, Beis Yaakov becomes like part of the yeshiva world, 
You have Vichna Kaplan's students referring to her as a Gadol Hador, like she was the Gadol for the women. Like there is very much a sense that she became like the role of the Rosh Hashiva for these students. And whereas someone in the Shiva world is going to link back to Eastern Europe through their Rebbe, so so Beis Yaakov developed its own Misora where girls are connected back to Sarishnir and through Sarishnir then to, you know, all the way back to Sari Menu. But the link for mm. the link is Sarishnir. So it becomes this um this Misora. And I, I have written a lot and I plan to write more about how Beis Yaakov was way more than a school. It was a place where girls and women created culture and it was a locus of religious culture. Absolutely. I also want to mention one thing about the connection, just because because you had mentioned, Yoel, that that um, that Ravar and Cutler didn't write about girls' education. Um, he was, though, at least a little bit involved. Um, he was somebody, he was on the rabbinic advisory boards for Beis Yaakov schools. He was somebody that Robinson Kaplan consulted. Um, and in 1963, which would be, you know, the year after he passed away, so that yearbook was dedicated to him. Yeah, so, so before getting back to, to Zev's point, um, it's actually interesting that he played a role in a lot of things that didn't come to the fore in his published in his published lectures. And I don't know if that has to do with what was published and how it was published and how it was edited, or whether it has to do with larger questions of the way in which his rhetoric was somehow different from his from his action. And he often spoke um, he spoke more extremely. Uh, he spoke more uncompromisingly than he was willing, and he was more willing to compromise in practice than he was in his rhetoric. Um, so, so I, you know, I think you're you're right in this in the sense that that just because he doesn't in his published writings doesn't speak a lot about women's education doesn't mean that he didn't care about it. That's certainly the truth. I think Zev has picked up on this question of elitism versus mass movement. Um, and exactly, it's almost, especially in this, in this period since the passing of, of Menachem Friedman, the great sociologist of the Haredi community and historian. Um, and, and that's his notion of Chevrat Alumdim, the society of learners, um, this idea that you can have a complete community that includes men, women, children, institutions, um, uh, schools, kindergartens, restaurants, that fundamentally at the center of this community are, 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 are kolel men, which is, you know, from a sociological and economic perspective, a very, very bizarre um, bizarre model of a community. And as he pointed out, it's dependent on the economic wealth that surrounds it. Um, so. So I think one of the great structural challenges that the whole yeshiva world uh, and also the Hasidic world is facing today uh, and has been facing for the, last, for the last 30 years is what do you do with a movement that's fundamentally elitist um, and has now become sociologically a mass movement? Not only a mass movement that's voluntary, it's not voluntary anymore. If you don't have a, uh, if, if, if 12 hours a day or 14 hours a day of, of learning Gemara is not your thing, um, you don't have a lot of, of options, especially in the Israeli Haredi world, but, but the American Haredi world also puts a lot of pressure. Um, because if this is the only valuable model, so that's great when you start off with 14 students who are really attracted to it and you build up to a couple of hundred students and you become the elite institution that's attracting the best and brightest from around North America. Well, what happens, as you, as, as, as you said, well, then there are children, second, third, fourth generation, and then you have all these, all these young men and young women whose whose paths are pushed in the direction of yeshiva and kolel oriented society and and it's no longer voluntary um it's now become this mass movement right the economics have to allow for a coal system and here just put up for a moment is uh Shlomo Volba, the author of the LA Shore, most people aren't familiar with, the, he wrote two different pamphlets, one for uh, uh, future brides and one for future grooms. Here's one for bride, and here's an excerpt uh, in which he says there, he's noticing at Beis Yaakov Seminar in Yerushalayim, and he's speaking to them in the early 70s. Uh, and as you, know, as you say, the linchpin is the Kolaman. 
And here he is suspecting, maybe he knows, that there are certain women who, when they get married, they realize, hey, I know more Hilcha Shabbos than my husband does. How could that be? And, uh, and, and then, in, in rather militant language, uh, says, you can't compare a Beis Yaakov curriculum with a Kolel man's curriculum. Uh, and it's, it's, it's rather sharp language, which my point in um, alerting everybody here to it isn't the sharpness of Revolva's tongue, but rather to indicate just what was at stake for this in the 70s emerging, this is in Israel, but the same can be found by Nissan Wolpin and the Jewish Observer at the same time, the uh, American monthly for the Good Israel. Um, just what was at stake for this community. And there is, the economics have to bear out the um, um, certain gender norms, their roles, the, the balabas has to be okay with a Yesachar uh, Zavul and I'm going to support the, the people actually learning, everybody has to know their role. What's fascinating is then who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, you know, we should all uh, eventually escape from COVID-19 and everybody should be well and safe. But what many people are starting to wonder is will the sociology, now that so many people have been introduced uh, to the internet more than ever before, and as the economics, uh, people aren't as affluent as they were uh, three and a half weeks ago. Um, so, yeah, yeah. The, the the feminist in me is a little bit rankled by that quote from Revolbi, um, and I actually want to want to point to a different piece of it, which is the moment that he's responding to, because he's not responding. It's true that the that the depth, uh, as far as 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 Gemara and Lambdas of the men's yeshiva curriculum, can't really compare to um, to the to the the Beis Yaakov curriculum. But it's also true in the other direction. The Beis Yaakov curriculum can't compare to the yeshiva curriculum. I mean, I have to give, give my employer a, a plug here. And, and one, of my, one of the first things that I did when I started working at the National Library was to purchase a case of, um, of student notebooks uh, from the 1930s from the Beis Yaakov Seminary in Krakow. Um, about 25 or 30 notebooks in Yiddish, Hebrew, and Polish um, from a, a young woman who, who later went on to, to found a Beis Yaakov and eventually came, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, to Israel. Um, and and the, from the notebooks, it's clear. My, my colleague, Hannah Luxenbaum, has recently written a little bit about these notebooks. And, and this is a very, very, very rigorous curriculum. They know Tanakh, they know Jewish history, they know something about the Maimonidean controversy, they know, uh, they know the Sidur, they know Perushim on the Sidur, they know, I mean, they're really learning a very, very rich, diverse curriculum that's meant to create broad literacy. And, and yes. the yeshiva, yeah, and, and the yeshiva curriculum is, is, is designed to create a very, very deep knowledge of a very narrow set. Uh, you know, the famous joke about the yeshiva guy who says, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know where that pasuk is from, but it's quoted in the Gemara and Pesach and Daf Kaf Talit. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, and they, 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 you know, who think about a Tanakh as a kind of expanded version of the, uh, of the Torah or on the side of the Gemara. Um, and and Revolbi is responding to that moment when the young woman who's been told that she's getting uh, the Beis Yaakov curriculum, but the yeshiva guys really know where it's at. And then it turns out that he may not know anything about Jewish history or Tanakh or, or the like. And it's that moment he's responding to. Um, and right, let's not even start about the secular education piece, where the, the girls have it, the boys don't. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is clearly what the moment is that you have a potentially, a, you know, generation of men who are intimidated by the learning of, of their potential wives. Like, where is that coming from? Or, the, or there's some issue there. I mean, I think that that, that in the shut up world today, there's this issue that, that um, women are so, are, I mean, I've heard this in the shut up where women are, are, they're more educated, they're more exposed. So I, I guess, I don't know if sophisticated is the word, but that there is, 
a discrepancy that is sometimes right but what this balanced. betokens what this betokens is that in order for this community to flourish you need that but the linchpin ought to be the cola right you know what's an interesting thing about what you're talking about elitism versus mass is that Beis Yaakov in itself was a was a reaction to the to the elitist view on um on girls education because Beis Yaakov was not the first school for girls uh, people believe that i know you know better but you know that that is a belief it, it's not true it wasn't even close to the first school what was different about Beis Yaakov is that the other schools that existed before were elitist they were for the wealthy they were for this group but Beis Yaakov was the first group to say no I mean, Sarshnir's idea is that everyone should have a Jewish education. That what makes Beis Yaakov different is the movement for mass education. So right. it's kind of interesting that you're saying it's, it's a mass movement to support an elitist movement that is then becoming a mass movement. Right. So it's complicated. So it's complicated. And uh, like most lessons in history, that's a good place to maybe conclude. Uh, uh, maybe for a sequel at one point. Uh, you know, hopefully we can do this in person one day. But in the meantime, uh, uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, and um, everybody at home, uh, thanks for joining. This was absolutely terrific. Thank you, Yoel. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. This was absolutely lovely. Chag Kasher My pleasure. Chag Kasher Bye. Chag Sameach.